Hello and welcome. Just over a week ago, the United Nations Security Council extended the mandate of United Nations mission in Nepal, or UNMIN, by four months. That means UNMIN will remain with us till 15th of September. This is the sixth time UNMIN's term has been extended. However, there are certain issues that about the UNMIN term extension that still confuses many. For one, UNMIN chief has said that it would be very difficult to finish the peace process within four months. On the other hand, UNMIN's stay for almost three years has not been free from controversy as well. It has also faced criticism. To talk about this, we have UNMIN chief uh, Karen Landgren in our studios. Welcome to our studios, Ms. Landgren. Thank you. You've been a busy person these days, uh, meeting political leaders every morning and it continues throughout the day. How has it been? Well, this is a critical moment in the peace process. And I came back from New York last week from the Security Council and the recent extension of the, of the mandate that you mentioned. So partly I want to brief the leaders on what is being said in the Security Council about the peace process and the content of our most recent mandate. Partly, of course, I want to hear from them how they see the resolution of the current crisis with the looming uh, deadline of the Constituent Assembly. Uh, we are almost sure, though it, it is yet to be officially announced, that a Constituent Assembly uh, may not be able to finish writing Constitution by the deadline it has already uh, been given. But in, in the wake of your coming back from Security Council and meeting all these leaders, uh, what do they say about this? What do they say about the mandate that has been given? Are they comfortable with the four-month period that mm -hmm, has been given? Mm -hmm. I'm being asked by many whether four months is sufficient. I was misquoted as saying that four months is not long enough for UNMIN. The real question is, is four months enough for the political parties? For UNMIN to be able to leave, uh, either the integration rehabilitation question needs to be well on its way to being sorted out, or we need to be able to hand over our monitoring responsibilities to someone else. What all the parties agree on is that it should be an orderly departure. It should be a departure that contributes to confidence in the peace process and, and doesn't create a new sense of, of anxiety, doesn't leave a vacuum, doesn't leave a gap in that, in that process. So whether the parties can reach agreement on the necessary details of integration and rehabilitation is really the question. I've been quite encouraged at the level of discussion that has taken place just over the past month. Two weeks. Yes. Right. Uh, finally, uh, core aspects of integration and rehabilitation are out on the table and they're in the media. It's quite extraordinary looking back, looking back over the last three and a half years, that only in the last few months has the numbers question come out in the open. Right now there's a lot of focus on numbers, but there are other details that need to be negotiated as well. Uh, so w would you say that the numbers that are being discussed with this, 3,000 or 30,000, it should have been discussed quite some time back. It should have been probably discussed uh, three years ago when, when the peace process was, uh, the peace accord was being signed. Different countries approach their peace agreements differently. In some countries you have every last detail negotiated ahead of time so it's just a matter of implementation. Here a different route was taken which was to keep many of the agreements quite broad and leave the details for to be sorted out later. Perhaps that is all that could be agreed at the time. But yes, we would have liked to see parties get to work immediately on addressing some of these critical details. And as we've seen with the numbers question, it's not easy. It's not straightforward. Uh, but this is the path that was chosen. The uh, bodies that were set up to work more on integration and rehabilitation, the special committee and the technical committee, also took time to get off the ground and functioning because everything again was subject to political negotiation. And that's the part that takes time. You, you said that it, it could be difficult given the political parties do not agree. Uh, what are the things that you think are, are not being agreed upon and what are the hurdles which may affect the peace process and your tenure and f for four more months that you've got mm -hmm. may not be enough? What could be the reasons? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm, I'm probably talking something very negative, but are there possibilities that four months may not be enough at all? 
The last mandate Anmin was uh, given was for four months. There were hopes that because of the CA deadline, the necessary work would be done in this, in this period. Clearly, that time, four months, was not sufficient. Uh, I hope that in the current round of discussion and negotiation, there will be agreement on critical implementation aspects of integration and rehabilitation. And that means, you know, looking at what we learned from the discharge process a few months ago, the planning process is extremely important. One reason the discharge went smoothly and could all be implemented within one month, which is really quite extraordinary, is that the parties and the UN had had a long time to, uh, to plan. So we are trying to emphasize the importance of good planning, good process, uh, and also that there should be an oversight body, some sort of monitoring body. One thing we can say for sure is that once the process begins, there will be problems that need to be ironed out. There needs to be a place uh, dissatisfied parties can go to see those problems resolved in a satisfactory way. So you, you're talking about one agency at the national level which addresses these things? Why not? Nepal has experience of a national monitoring body. Uh, with the ceasefire code of conduct in 2006, there was the National Peace Monitoring Committee. And that worked, as far as I know, completely satisfactorily. The peace agreement itself foresaw national oversight bodies, monitoring bodies, but they were never set up. The only peace monitoring body that was ever established after 2006 was the Joint Monitoring Coordination Committee. That's well, for what the about the peace ministry that we have? The peace ministry uh, plays a very important role in the peace process, but I think we've seen that with changes in government, the peace ministry also changes to fit the, the color of the moment, the political, the political so leadership. Uh, what we are you need an about impartial. We, what we are talking about body. a strong monitoring agency at national level, which is not taking sides of the government or the opposition. One of the problems mm -hmm. in the peace process that everyone comes back to is the lack of trust, the lack of confidence. So to expect that as implementation of particular aspects begins, that the parties can simply sit together and come to agreement is unrealistic. I think there needs to be a third party, a national peace committee or the like, national monitoring body, that has enough trust, that is viewed as unbiased, as nonpartisan, that can be counted on to, to try and keep the process on track. Otherwise, when commitments aren't, aren't met, aren't fulfilled, as we're seeing now, everything risks just turning into a blame game, turning into a, a political weapon for parties to use against one We've another. We've had that quite a lot in, in recent times. And <clears throat> can, you, can you practically say that it's possible to have a national monitoring agency when we have this habit of uh, uh, having commissions and, and w which have members from every political party coming in there. It's, it's more about power sharing seats. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, an idea of impartial national commission which, which monitors the peace agreement as well as the peace process. It is possible and I think the National Peace uh, Monitoring Committee is a good example you can find people who are uh, respected, independent, impartial, trusted by all sides to implement this. Now one interesting aspect of the Security Council resolution extending UNMIN's mandate is that they call for uh, a timeline. They call on the parties to develop a timeline for the implementation of integration and rehabilitation with clear benchmarks. That's new language about the benchmarks. Certainly, a timeline with benchmarks would be helpful in moving the process along. What I would add is that the timeline should be realistic. Nepal's peace process uh, is marked by very optimistic deadlines and commitments, which only leads to disappointment then when they're not. It's, it's interesting uh, that you in also time. mentioned the benchmarks because. Uh, two and a half years ago, when I was interviewing Ian Martin, the then uh, 
chief of Unmen. Then also we talked about benchmarks. The issue of benchmarks were still there, but it, was it ever set? Was it not? Uh, is that not the reason why we are where we are? It is, it is part of the problem. Uh, the, the factors I've, I've mentioned, the lack of detail in the original agreements, the lack of oversight mechanism that could have helped it along, and the lack of a structured process for discussions and, and negotiations. The sorts of discussions we're seeing now should have been taking, taken place years ago, should have started years ago. And speaking of your interview with, with Ian Martin, I was looking back over uh, discussions that took place in 2007 that talked about uh, confusion, stalemate, mistrust. You know, this is normal in the aftermath of, of peace agreements. The parties have many reasons to mistrust each other and it takes time to, uh, to build up a degree of confidence. But this is where impartial institutions uh, can help. So benchmarking as well uh, will help the process because it will uh, create more of an understanding of the sequence in which different, uh, different aspects of implementation have to take place. You know, this follows, this follows, follows this. With integration and rehabilitation, it's not just the numbers. It's the modalities, it's the question of how are standard norms to be applied uh, in this case. It is rank equivalency and other technical matters. And then the question of what are the rehabilitation packages going to look like for those who choose not uh, to go into the security forces or are not eligible. There are a lot of details to be worked out and benchmarks can be helpful. And we, we talked about the disqualification of the combatants mm -hmm. as well. Uh, it, it was, you said that uh, the discharge process was smooth, but in media it was reported uh, and in lots of uh, Maoist combatants who were discharged were not happy with the decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we saw that mm -hmm. and there are many lessons learned from the discharge process. One is that it would have been much better if it could have happened as planned early on. So are, are we uh, keeping loose ends somewhere? Which, which can be inflammable at maybe five years later. That's right, that's right. These details, what look like details, if they're mm -hmm. not sorted out now, aren't going to go away. Uh, and now we're not talking about 4,000 odd disqualified, but almost 20,000 who were verified in the exercise. It's very important both for the future of the peace process that they be settled appropriately, that there be a, a good solution and a dignified solution. It's also important for them as individuals that they go on with their lives in a satisfactory way. Other countries that have come out from, uh, from long conflicts have found that if they don't address properly the issue of former combatants or former insurgents, that's not a problem that goes away easily. Former combatants have one clear skill and that's not the skill you want to see used again in a country at peace. So would you say that we are sitting on a time bomb? I wouldn't say that because one, uh, one extraordinary thing about this peace process is uh, that the elements of a solution are known. Everyone recognizes that uh, the almost 20,000 former Maoist army combatants need a solution and they're working on it now. I think people see the risks if it's not addressed properly, but the work is taking place. Are you satisfied with the work? It's Probably. been much slower than we would have liked. And uh, you know, in 2008, Prachanda asked Anmin and he asked the Secretary General to lend our support uh, and to coordinate international assistance to the integration and rehabilitation process. The Security Council has this time around as well called on the parties to make maximum use of Anmin while we're still here. And we are available to support the process. But we're here in a support role. This is Nepal-owned, Nepal-driven process. It's your process. It, it's, we would like to see you move a little faster on some we, of the aspects. It's interesting you say that because at times, uh, Anmin has also been accused of being involved in, in too many things. They, they are also seen as some some agency which is pushing the Nepali side uh, to do, I mean, you've also been accused of 
siding over the Maoists. Well, let me take these two points separately. One is pushing the parties. I mean, Nepal, the UN mission in Nepal was set up for a limited duration and with a fixed purpose. Looking back, we can say it was optimistic to expect that all these functions, functions would be resolved within one year, the election, the integration and rehabilitation. Uh, but this is an investment by the international community, by the Security Council, to have this mission here. And we would not be doing our job if we didn't encourage the parties, push the parties, if you will, to move more quickly on some of these core aspects of the peace process. Once integration and rehabilitation is settled or the monitoring arrangements are changed, Anmin can leave. And our aim has never been to extend ourselves here, uh, you know, to make this a, life, a lifetime employment. Our aim has been to get our job done and say goodbye. Now, the criticisms that have been made against Anmin are not let me add you. to that uh, yes. before you answer uh, you being accused of pro -ma -ma being a pro Maoist. E even recently, when Lin Pasco was here, mm -hmm. he, he, he defended Unmin, saying the allegations ma made against Unmin was absurd and, mm -hmm. and, and lowly. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Pasco was, uh, was blunt and his message was clear. That, that was clear. very, very <laughs> undiplomatic uh, to say that. I wouldn't say it was undipl undiplomatic. It was uh, a different style of communication than, than, uh, than people were accustomed to, I think. Mr. Pascoe's main message was that uh, this very positive thing, that the parties recognize what is needed to resolve this issue, and they need to get on with it. I mean, Nepal is in a much, much better place than many countries going through peace processes. And we often say that this is a model of a peace process. Setbacks are normal. But the talking is, is continuing. The point Mr. Pasco made about the attacks against Unmin was, you know, reflect the gap uh, between expectations and what Unmin has really been asked to do. If you look at one, what Unmin has been asked to do, it is now that the electoral part is concluded, it's about supporting uh, the monitoring of the management of the arms and armies. It's really focused on the agreements that were reached about arms and armies. They were never intended to last this long, these agreements. Many people say to us now, look, the situation has changed. But the agreements are it, and we have to respect the, the agreements. Unless we have newer agreements. Unless you have newer agreements. Yes. Which could be as broad as they are now, or would you say it needs to be more specific? The arms monitoring agreement is one of the more specific agreements. Mm -hmm. And this is an agreement that had a monitoring body with it. So the Joint Monitoring Coordination Committee, which brings together the Nepal Army and the Maoist Army and is chaired by Anmin, meets routinely like clockwork and its aim is to get problems resolved at the lowest possible level, to stop them uh, mushrooming into bigger political issues. And that is, what we, that is what we do. And how do you address the accusations of Unmin being pro maoist We try to address them up front, which is why it's a great opportunity to come, and, to come and speak like this. These accusations are not new. You know, my predecessor was routinely mm -hmm. accused of, of being a Maoist. And I also remember him going at, attending a function where uh, Maoist leaders were there in a cantonment, mm -hmm. and, and they, were, they had a full military parade going on, which, was, mm -hmm. which should not have been taking place. I mean, it was not in Martin, but his uh, other officers were there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. There's been a lot of discussion about what is appropriate and, and what is not. But let me say a word about why I think some of these misunderstandings are there. And the first is the concept of monitoring. Uh, what is the monitoring role of Anmin? There is an expectation on the part of many that monitoring is closer to control, to policing, to enforcement. Every time a Maoist is found outside a cantonment with a UN registered weapon, it is Anmin, how could you have allowed that to happen? Well, Anmin is not in a position to prevent any of the parties breaking, breaching the peace agreements. But you, you're supposed to uh, sound an alarm. 
You know, when mm -hmm. someone walks out of a cantonment with a weapon in their hand, if you've seen the cantonments, you will understand that these are not hermetically sealed mm -hmm. spaces. We get involved as soon as we hear there is an allegation of breach and we look into it. But preventing breaches is really in the hands of the parties. A lot of these agreements are based on a high level of trust. I, I would agree and to that. And a remarkable I mean, aspect you, you, of the process. You of the may process. not be policing it, but when, when somebody breaches that, uh, you're accused of failing to sound an alarm. Why is that? I think that's an unfair criticism because we do take up every allegation of breach when it happens. This is also where some of the misunderstanding comes in. When Unmin goes to the police station or the CDO to look into what happened, the story tends to be Unmin came to bail out the, the Maoist to protect. You know. But I think we're uh, a pretty equal opportunity critic. When there is a violation, we always take it up. Uh, we always try to resolve it, of course, uh, in a satisfactory way to both parties. And this is also where the JMCC gets involved. But if you look back to something like the Kapilvastu incident, which was a serious breach, uh, as soon as we learned about that, we said this is a very serious violation. And we, we followed through, through, we took it up in, in JMCC. But let me add one more reason to why I think Unmin comes under, under criticism, and this is probably an understandable one. Unmin is associated with the peace process as a whole, and now, three and a half years down the line, there are people who are not happy with the way things have, have turned out. So like it or not, we are uh, mm -hmm. associated with that process, and there is only a peace process as long as the Maoists remain engaged. We see as part of our role remaining engaged with all the actors in the peace process. And that does lead us to criticism. So you would say that uh, Unmin unintentionally staying for this long? Demanded. It has not been Unmin's intention to stay this stay long. long. Yeah. And we have never... Uh, as some people say, courted controversy. We certainly don't court controversy. We court solutions. Uh, but it's inevitable that controversy comes up. Let's also briefly talk about Unmen's uh, relations with the government. Mm -hmm. Government was not, mm -hmm. the present government was mm -hmm. not too happy when uh, you refused to disclose some of the details that mm -hmm. government needed. Mm -hmm. There were two different issues on the table. One was the personal data relating to uh, the Maoist army personnel, where if you look at the arms monitoring agreement, Unmin is explicitly tasked with treating that information with appropriate confidentiality. We are bound by that. So we, uh, we were in extensive discussions with the government to understand what the problem was and how it could be addressed. In other words, we were very solution oriented. A second issue was how many Maoists are in the cantonments? That's a, an entirely legitimate question, and that is up to the Maoists uh, to say. And it took us far too long, it took the Maoists far too long to come up with that response in the JMCC. Now, at the root of the problem from the government side was who is being paid in the cantonments. You know, there were, uh, there were uncertainties about whether people were still there, about whether the right people were being paid. And I'm very pleased to say that we were able to work with uh, the Maoists and the government to resolve the payments question. And just in these days, payment, uh, the, a fresh round of payment has been completed in all the cantonment site. And I understand you know, the peace minister, Rakam Chemjong, uh, went to the beginning of the payment and went to the end in the last cantonment. And there seems to be full satisfaction on the government side now. Government, with is, the way government is completely satisfied. With that's it. what we understand. So I'm very pleased that this They've has been... They've explicitly said so. I, I understand the peace minister has, has said that he's satisfied with the process. That's good enough for me. That's good enough. And, and I hope that government remains satisfied with you and you're able to do what you came for within the time you've been given right now. It's critical to our work that we remain uh, on good terms with all the actors in the peace process. I will certainly do my part for that. And part of that is keeping open lines of communication with everyone and making Unmin's work as transparent as it can be. We hope it, it really helps and 
our peace process comes to a conclusion. Thank you very much. That is our fervent Karen hope Landgren. as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was Ms. Karen Landgren, Chief of Unmin, talking to us. News continues at Kanthipur TV, but for now, goodbye. Thank you.